It's at least partly NATO's fault that Russia invaded Ukraine. The end of the Cold War signaled a turn in world history. The West had triumphed over the Soviet Union, all without ever firing a single shot. But as the new millennium approached, it was important to set the stage for lasting peace. The last thing NATO wanted was yet another Cold War. After the Berlin Wall fell, it became clear that the old Soviet order was on its last legs. In a bid to lower the risk of catastrophic war, NATO and the Soviet Union cooperated on a series of efforts to reduce both nuclear and conventional military power in Europe. Some of these efforts had been in place for years, but the effort culminated in the Treaty on Conventional Armed Forces in Europe. This sought to set a hard limit for certain amounts of military hardware, so as to achieve a level of parity between NATO and the Warsaw Pact. This would put a cap on the runaway arms race between the two powers, but unbeknownst to the Soviet Union, greatly favored the more technologically advanced Western militaries, as the world would find out at the conclusion of Desert Storm. One of the fading Soviet Union's greatest concerns as revolution swept across its western flank was that NATO would capitalize on the opportunity and expand closer to the Soviet Union's borders, something that the Soviets saw as completely unacceptable. The Soviet Union had good reason for wanting NATO to stay at arm's length. Twice in two world wars and many times in the centuries prior, the Soviet Union's territory was invaded by western armies. Situated at the far end of the European plain, the approaches directly into the heart of Soviet territory were largely indefensible. The Warsaw Pact nations afforded the Soviets a shield against yet another Western invasion. On February 6, 1990, West German Foreign Minister Hans Dietrich Genscher stated that NATO does not intend to expand its territory to the east. This infamous statement would be considered a broken promise in the years to come by the new Russian nation. Yet, as many Western leaders have pointed out, it did not represent actual NATO policy. For a time, things started to look up for relations in Europe. As of July 1990, the NATO Secretary General visited Moscow in a historic first to discuss cooperation between the Soviet Union and NATO. However, the Soviet Union disintegrated soon after, and the nation of Russia was formally born from its ashes. The situation remained optimistic at first, with Russia signing official cooperation pacts with NATO. In 1994, Russia joined the Partnership for Peace program, signaling a warming between East and West relations. That same year, though, Russia created the Collective Security Treaty Organization, a mirror to NATO, and featuring such military and economic heavyweights as Belarus, Armenia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan. Russia was once more seeking a buffer between itself and NATO, but also to help consolidate some of the political power it lost when these former Soviet republics broke away. Despite this, though, relations between Russia and NATO continued to warm. Despite protests over the ever-expanding NATO membership to countries such as the Czech Republic and Hungary, whom Russia still considered within its own sphere of influence, however, these countries represented little threat to Russian defense, and relations became so cordial that we almost stepped into an alternate timeline altogether. The idea of Russia joining NATO itself is not as crazy as it seems. Indeed, as far back as 1990, Mikhail Gorbachev proposed to U.S. Secretary of State James Baker that the Soviet Union should join NATO. However, the situation was politically impossible, as well as logistically. NATO had a strict set of requirements for a nation to join, which included a great deal of basic human rights, as well as a democratically elected government. These conditions did not exist in the Soviet Union. But with the fall of communism, Russia adopted democracy, ostensibly. This opened up the door to NATO membership, and during a visit to Moscow in 2000 by President Bill Clinton, Russian President Vladimir Putin, freshly put into power to save Yeltsin from going to prison for a long time, floated to Clinton the possibility of joining NATO. Before blowing up a bunch of civilians to secure his bid for the Russian presidency, Vladimir Putin spoke to reporter David Frost during a BBC interview, in which he said, Russia is a part of European culture, and I cannot imagine my own country in isolation from Europe and what we often call the civilized world. Relations were at an all-time high in 2001 when President Putin called U.S. President George Bush to offer personal condolences for the attack on the World Trade Centers. The two were well on their way to being BFFs, with President Bush even gazing lovingly into Putin's eyes on at least one occasion. The next year, Russia gave critical intelligence to U.S. forces as the American military entered the city of Kabul. Putin was the West's new darling, and after an exhaustive five decades of Cold War, the West was more than ready to entertain the fantasy of Russia joining NATO. 
but many in the West saw Putin for the young, unbotoxed and non-steroid using mass murderer that he really was. They pointed to the Russian atrocities in Chechnya, where entire cities had been reduced to rubble by Russian forces. Civilians were purposefully targeted by Russian weapons in a bid to wage a war of terror and demoralize Chechnyans into submission. Human rights atrocities occurred daily with the express consent and even instruction of the Russian government. This was not a nation that could realistically be allowed to join NATO. Things would soon take a turn. Former Soviet republics like Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania began to join NATO in the mid-2000s, drawing immediate protests from Russian hardliners. They saw this as an act of provocation and even claimed that NATO had violated promises made at the end of the Cold War to not expand east. However, NATO was quick to rebuff these accusations. The situation began to heat up and hopes for Russia joining NATO were evaporating. The death of Anna Politkovskaya, a Russian journalist and human rights activist who had covered Russian war crimes in the Second Chechen War, drew immediate ire from the West. Politkovskaya had received numerous death threats and intimidation attempts while she reported on the war, even being arrested by the Russian military and subjected to a mock execution. In 2004, she was poisoned while flying out of Moscow, though prompt medical attention saved her life. On October 7th, a day which is totally by coincidence Putin's birthday, she was found murdered in her elevator. Who had ordered the contract killing remains a mystery to this day. No grand prize for guessing that it was probably Putin himself. The incident opened the floodgates for revelations about the inner workings of Russia, where violence and intimidation against journalists, political dissidents, and those who challenged Putin's power were as common as they had been during the Soviet Union's days. Some wrote this off as Russophobia, though the truth would continue to leak out of the country due to even more high-profile assassinations and mysterious disappearances. Russia simply did not have the right values for NATO. In March 2009, the Polish foreign minister tried to revive the dream of real peace in Europe, suggesting that Russia join NATO. The Russian NATO envoy responded that Russia had not ruled it out as a future possibility, but right now preferred to merely cooperate. Russia had dreams of being a major influential power on the world stage, and it was unbecoming of Russia to thus join a coalition of powers it deemed to be equivalent or lesser to itself, but certainly not greater. By the mid-2010s, the dream had disappeared entirely. Putin had turned his back on the West and denounced Western liberal values. Instead, he focused on Asia, and thus the great competition between NATO and Russia was reborn. For its part, NATO had expanded right to Russia's northern doorstep and many former Soviet client states were now part of the Western alliance. Russia warned repeatedly that NATO better not dare expand any closer, with Ukraine especially in Russia's crosshairs. Russia worked hard to promote a pro-Russian government in Ukraine, but by 2016, Ukrainians, tired of being manipulated by Russia, rose up and overthrew their pro-Russian president when he rejected a proposal that would bring Ukraine into the EU fold. Instead, he'd agreed to a different treaty which would bring Ukraine far more in line with Russia. The Ukrainian people exploded into a frenzy of revolutionary spirit, and within days, Ukraine's government was brought to its knees. Ukraine enshrined into its constitution measures that guaranteed the nation would be put on a path toward membership in both the European Union and NATO, and pro-Western leaders began the necessary measures to reform the country to qualify for NATO membership. But the nation was also at war, with Russia having invaded and seized Crimea and now fueling a war in breakaway eastern regions. This did not deter Ukraine from wishing to join NATO, and Russia warned that if the nation joined it, it would mean war. Despite this, NATO refused to throw out the possibility of Ukraine joining, and even directly sent personnel to train Ukrainian troops while providing low levels of military aid. In a very real way, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is at least partly NATO's fault. It was the inevitable conclusion to Ukraine's increasing desire for membership in the Western institutions while it created distance between itself and Russia. This was a real hard red line for Russia that every NATO member was aware of, and yet the organization did nothing to preclude Ukraine joining and thus lowering tensions. Putin would go on to use this as justification to blame the West for his invasion. However, NATO is an alliance of the willing, which champions the values of liberal democracies. Therefore, while NATO could have assured Russia that Ukraine wouldn't join NATO, that would run in direct contrast to its values of self-determination for each nation. At the end of the day, Putin, and only Putin, is truly to blame for his catastrophic invasion. Now, go check out What If Ukraine Loses the War to Russia, or click this other video instead.